morning and welcome to our online and on-site ministries. Ndi macheroni Grace Cuff, ndi abaresha zinane la mrena washu Yesu Kristo, ndi ribotanga nezwa katero ya shonda ya macheroni ya duwa lana musi, karibi pine rote nga fungo la muzimu. Ah! Welcome by online kerk in Upside. Good morning, good morning. My name is Ben and I've got my best friend here, Tina. Uh, it is a great privilege actually today to be with you and to host this meeting. Um, I know the year is drawing to a close and a lot of things do happen in the festive. People get excited, uh, people get worried. Um, as the year draws to a close. However, in our case, our hope is pinned on the Lord. Our joy is in the Lord. We just look up to Him and uh, everything will be fine. But however, if you are worried, I would rather we all align and be at the same level to praise and worship and thank God. If you happen to be worried, here's a message for you from Tina. Good morning, friends. Thank you so much for joining us online. We have a comment section. Please feel free to leave your comments and your prayer requests. So just as Ben mentioned, we are going to read from 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 3. The Lord is saying, But the Lord is faithful, and He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Let us trust the Lord. He is going to protect us this festive season. Please join us for worship. Thank you. <laughs> Just to find 
You are here and moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. And you are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. And you are here, and healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you, Lord. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, and that is who you are. You are here. Turning lives around I worship you I worship you You are here Mending every heart I worship you I worship you Lord You are way maker Miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is that is who you are, and that is who you are, 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 Lord. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Oh. It's who you are You are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here Working in this place I worship Keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, 
my God, that is who you are. 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 And that is who you are. 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 Hello, everybody. It's so cool to be able to pray for the nations. And the reason why we at Grace Cove have been doing this insert into our Sunday meetings is because Genesis chapter 12 says that God will bless uh, Abraham and his descendants of faith and that they will be a blessing goes on to say that all nations will be blessed through them and then jesus said in the new testament that his house in other words the place where people gather to worship him will be known as a house of prayer for all nations and so we want to be part of more than just our own neighborhood and backyard we want to be part of a, being a blessing to the nations of the world and so this morning we're going to pray for uh, poland in central europe Poland has 38 million people uh, in the population, very diverse people from all over Europe come to study there um, in a number of university towns and a very diverse culture. Uh, the, the, the country is three times the size of South Africa and it has the largest, uh, the, the largest land mass in Europe. The capital is Warsaw and uh, it's 93% Catholic. It's known as the second most Catholic country outside of the Vatican. Isn't that amazing? Um, although only 40% of its residents would uh, attend Mass on a regular basis. So high percentage Catholic, not many attendees. It's been a country since the 10th century, but it's always been attacked. Its borders have always shifted around because the neighbors always seeming to attack them and cut up the country and so with that, the, the country has developed a very strong Polish identity and a very strong cultural identity. Uh, up until 1989, it had been ruled by the Russian communists. And so just the other day, uh, it came into a sense of freedom. And when you walk the streets, as Colette and I have, there's still a very a hushed sense of people kind of looking out, wondering if people are watching them and uh, if uh, they're free to be who they want to be. And uh, the Polish are known as doers. Mm, my sister-in-law's father is a Pole, and uh, apparently they can do anything. They can build, they can do whatever they put their minds to, they can do. They're a nation of doers. They're great people. And so we partner with one church in the whole of Poland. Their names are Wojtek and Kirsten Krakowski, and they lead a church in Krakow called New Covenant Church Krakow. And uh, man... The neighboring, nations are very, the, the neighboring nations don't have partnering churches either. So this morning I'd like to pray for Wojtek and Kirsten, that the Lord would encourage them. I'd like to pray that God would um, send church planters to that nation. Uh, think of Warsaw, the capital, it needs a church plant there. And uh, that God would bring partners into the neighboring parts of Central Europe as well. Very far to not have neighbors that are able to support you and be partners. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this great nation. We thank you for its position in Europe. And Lord, we pray that from Poland, the gospel would go out. So at local level, we ask Jesus that people would be born again and set free to worship you. And then we pray, Lord, that they would uh, build strong and that we would see them sending planters into other parts of Europe. We ask, Lord, that you would send planters to Poland and that there would be other churches that could partner with Wojtek and Kirsten as well on a national level. And Father, we pray this, that you would encourage Wojtek and Kirsten, that you'd strengthen them, provide for them, that you would uh, grow this church to be a great model church. And Lord, that from Poland into Central Europe, the gospel would advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for some beautiful music. Uh, this is a time where you really feel like it's, it's a wonderful thing to be in the house of the Lord and praise and worship and sing. Uh, I can sing, yeah, I can sing. But uh, when people sing, uh, I, can, I can tell you this is uh, fine music. Thank you to our musicians. 
And our key announcements uh, for this week, uh, please uh, take note, if you don't belong to a life group, here is your opportunity. Our life groups happen between Tuesday and Thursday. Please do find one. Please join a life group, be encouraged, stay connected. They all, uh, most of them start at 7 p.m., so please find, uh, do find one. And then uh, some interesting news here uh, for the all -Star. Hi, everyone. We are so glad to be back on site and even more happier to have our All-Star Kids open for all ages, 3 to 12. So why don't you join us? If you need more information, please access our website. It's appearing on, on screen right now. Then we will be ending our All-Star Kids YouTube channel at the end of November. But don't worry, you'll still be able to access the kids channel on the website. So, two very important dates to remember for our kiddos. 6th of December and the 13th of December. What's happening? On the 6th of December, we will have our famous games day. But this year with a little bit of a difference, we'll be having social distancing games. 13th of December is high on our kids calendar. It will be our year in celebration. Remember, 6th of December, 13th of December at 9 o'clock in the morning on site. Thank you. Please uh, prepare for your all stars um, to come and enjoy. Unfortunately, you can't enjoy it, it's, it's only for the all stars. Uh, Tina? Please take note of our December meetings. Christmas Day, we'll be meeting at 8 30 to 9 30 on site and online. Please take note that on the 27th of December, we don't have the on site meeting, we only have the online meeting at 9 o'clock. Thank you. Great. We still praise the Lord even uh, during Christmas. That's a good thing. Um, so, for your tithes and offerings, we do that as a way of uh, worshipping also as a church. Please take a look at the banking details on your screen and uh, do please give accordingly. If you intend to give to a specific person or a specific cause, please do mark your your contributions arms a l m s uh, please remember that and yeah thank you for your contributions towards uh, the work of the lord right so it's it's time now to go into the word time to feed from the word uh, we've got a message prepared by our lead elder at grace Calf church um, craig mayor craig uh, please step up and yeah let's see what the lord has prepared for us today Thank you, and uh, please do enjoy the words. Thank you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven.
Hey, well, hello everybody. Welcome. It's great to have you joining with us on YouTube. Uh, so grateful that you've joined in. And uh, I'm reminding you, have you said hello in the comments? Have you reached out to some of your mates that are watching with you at the same time? And also, have you invited someone to watch with you this morning to join in at Grace Cup Church online? Or perhaps you've suggested someone come here to 145 Glover on site. I'm encouraging you, especially with Christmas, it's such a great time to use the season to reach out to people to point them towards Jesus. So if you haven't this week, man, during the week, why don't you start sending the link to uh, a friend or someone that you know is interested and say, man, I'd love you to watch the Sunday meeting with me or at the same time as me and uh, make the most of this. We can still point people towards Jesus. We can still reach out for the gospel's sake, whether you're watching at home or coming here on site. We are still able to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and be ambassadors for him. So I'd love you to do that. So one of the Christian classics is called the Fox's Book of Martyrs. It was first published in 1563. And can you believe it? It's still in print today and it's uh, still read. In fact, it's recommended reading and uh, many Bible school students still have to get, uh, get through it. Um, and it's very popular even today. It's a history of Christians who suffered for the gospel over time. The author John Fox said, A good Christian is bound to relinquish not only goods and children, but life itself for the glory of his Redeemer. Therefore, I am resolved to sacrifice everything in this transitory world for the sake of salvation in a world that will last to eternity. I was looking at Amazon and I found this recent review written by someone uh, just a couple of months ago and they put it this way, other than the Bible, this is the best book ever read by the eyes of mortals and it's the most disturbing, the most dreadful, the most amazing and the most beautiful story ever told. Here is the rarest form of sacrifice ever to be shown to the world. The kings of the known world despised them, but the king of heaven accepted them, and their deaths made them rulers of the world to come. You know, there was a Dutch man who began to smuggle Bibles over the Iron Curtain into communist countries from uh, the 1950s, and he's continued his whole life. And he became known as Brother Andrew. And uh, over the years, he began, he founded an organization to help Christians in persecuted countries, which is called Open Doors. And he said, Lord, whenever, wherever, however you want me to go, I will go. I'll begin this very minute. Lord, as I stand up from this place, as I take my first step forward, will you consider this a step towards complete obedience with you? I'll call it the step of yes. So what Open Doors do, one of the, the features that they have is they survey the top 50 countries that are most hostile to Christians in the world. And they say that in this past year, in other words, a year ago to date, 260 million Christians were persecuted for following Jesus Christ. In fact, they say one in nine Christians worldwide experience high levels of persecution. They say there's been a 6% increase year on year um, in the number of Christians who experience high levels of persecution. Nearly 3,000 Christians were killed for their faith in this last year in the top 50 worst countries. That's nearly nine every day of the year. They say that nearly 4,000 Christians have been detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned in these top 50 countries just in the last year. That's 11 every day on average. Nearly 10,000 churches or Christian buildings have been attacked in these top 50 countries. That's 26 a day on average. In other words, more than one building every hour, every day of the whole entire year. In fact, they say 11 countries score in the extreme level for persecution of Christians. You know that six years ago, there was only one country that rated that extreme level uh, quantity. Now, in, in six years later, we have 11. That one country 
six years ago was North Korea. And North Korea has been the worst country with the most oppression of Christians for the last 19 years. According to the World Christian Encyclopedia, 60% of Christians live under significant restrictions on their religious freedom. But remember that religious uh, uh, persecution is on a new thing. It started the moment that John the Baptist came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it's in this context that Jesus invites his hearers into a life that's sold out to him. Remember, he takes them out onto the hills just outside Jerusalem and he begins to talk to them. And with each beatitude, he drives another nail in the coffin of our right to live anyhow the way we please. You see, some people try and follow Jesus, but their lives are unchanged. And they still live lives that mirror the culture of the day. But Jesus invites us to follow him. And then he begins to teach us how we should live and what that should look like. And so in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, as we've been working along, Jesus calls us to live a different way, a countercultural way. And the question is, how do we know if we're living countercultural to the culture of the day? Well, we know we live in countercultural lives when we stand out, when we don't fit in, when we are different to the culture of the day. So welcome this morning to Counterculture Episode 5, Blessed Are Those Who Are Persecuted. So let's read Matthew 5 together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for the, in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. The blessed are the persecuted. The first thing I want to say is blessed are the persecuted. So it's the eighth and the final beatitude that we're looking at this morning. And it could sound a little bit negative. Oh, blessed are the persecuted. You see, up until this point, the Beatitudes have focused on humility, meekness, right relationships, mercy, purity of heart, peacemaking, all positive attitudes. You, you may well think, gee, those are great uh, qualities in a friend, aren't they? You want people like that around, and they all seem like good things. And then this last one seems to be a bit of a downer, doesn't it? Blessed are you when you are persecuted. You might think, oh, I might be able to do the rest, make myself humble, Follow Jesus, let him control me in my meekness. But man, Lord, I don't know about being persecuted. As I've told you that even in our modern day, persecution of Christians is worldwide phenomenon. 60% of Christians in the world. My goodness. How about you and I today? It's a guarantee. To most of us in South Africa today, persecution is a pretty vague concept, right? Right? It happens to people far, far away or else those who lived long, long ago. In all honesty, when you and I speak about persecution, oh, that guy at work, dot, 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 we often don't mean putting our lives on the line for Jesus or risking imprisonment or true hardship for our faith. The truth is that the, when we talk about persecution and the persecution that often fills us with fear and complaint is made of far milder stuff. Yet it draws out of us far louder complaints than many who did indeed give up their lives for Jesus' gospel. I remember when I first got saved, very early on, I remember someone saying this. They said that it's possible out of our love and care and concern for those around us, particularly family members or close friends, it's possible that we are tempted to try and ease the suffering or challenge that Jesus himself has caused us to triumph over it's just like trying to help a bird break out of its shell you can damage the bird and and lose its life right and sometimes jesus himself has brought us into a hardship yay though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death right 
And yet, in our pastoral good-heartedness, it's easy for us to come alongside and try and tear each other up and take a shortcut towards comfortable living rather than stand with each other as we go through that valley and let God work in us and let the persecution produce the fruit that God wants in our lives. <laughs> Often I think of first world problems and paper cut persecution for those of us that live in South Africa, right? <laughs> I wonder if this week you've complained, oh, the Wi-Fi is so slow. Perhaps you've been to the shops and in all the full shelves and all the options that you have, you've been frustrated because you couldn't find the right flavor, the exact color or the perfect style that you had in mind. You grumpy. Maybe you got a haircut. <laughs> and it wasn't to your liking. Maybe you were complaining because the television remote wasn't working properly, or you couldn't pick up a good signal. I mean, now through lockdown, WhatsApp calls and video calls have become the norm, right? And it's always that thing, you make a WhatsApp call, hello, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And we get so sort of frustrated when a WhatsApp call doesn't work, don't we? <laughs> How about the, the good old one of, oh no, my phone battery is dying. Uh, it's known as low battery anxiety, apparently. And we speak about first world problems. There are people out there dying. And you and I are complaining about our little paper cuts, our perceived hardships of life in comparison. Now notice Jesus said, blessed are the those that are persecuted. First of all, he said, for righteousness sake. And then secondly, he said, persecuted because of me. Now I think that often our troubles are our own doing. We make our own potholes to stand in. It's to stand both feet into. But then when things go wrong and it's our fault, we curse the devil, we complain that God has abandoned us, but it's our fault. It's something that we did. When you are grumpy with your wife or short-tempered with your children, and when they turn around and they respond in kind, you think, oh no, what did I do to deserve this? You're late to work. You do a half-a-hearted job. You never turn in your stuff on time, and then you wonder why the boss doesn't like you. I think it's so easy for us to, to feel a sense of persecution when actually it's just because we're at fault and God's using it to change our hearts and get us to be like Him. And Jesus said, if you're persecuted, man, you will only be blessed if it's persecuted for righteousness sake and because of me, not because of your sloppy behavior. Sometimes I wonder whether it's our doing or our choosing that we become persecuted. You see, when someone says, aha, oh, it's his fault. He did it. It's of his doing. Yeah? In other words, when I'm on my phone sending a message, driving down the freeway, and I bump the car in front of me, right? Whose fault is that? Do I blame the devil? Do I blame Apple because they made the iPhone? Do I play, blame MTN because they gave me a single signal at the wrong time? <laughs> do, I, do I blame my lot in life because if I had a Tesla, I could just speak and it would send the message? What do I do? Well, who's at fault? It's me, right? Sometimes we point our fingers at God, say, God, you did this to me. When no, actually it's of my own doing. We've got to ask ourselves, is it of my doing or my choosing? You see, choosing is a different matter entirely. Choosing is when we embrace the challenge for a higher reason. We count the cost like the Bible says. We think it through. We say, actually, this has a demand on me. This will come at a price, but I'm choosing to pay that price willingly. Is it my doing or my choosing? Luke chapter 9 verse 51 puts it this way. It says of Jesus that, that as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Friends, can I ask you, are you on a resolute path? Or are you just wandering haphazardly all over the show? And when someone shouts at you, you respond. And when someone speaks nicely to you, you respond. Or have you set yourself on a path resolutely knowing that that's the path that will be favored by Jesus? And when people are horrible to you, you bless them. And when people love you, you return love and kind. Is it our doing or choosing whether we are persecuted or not? Jesus said, blessed are the persecu those persecuted for my sake. The second thing I want to say this morning is that persecution should not be a surprise to Jesus' followers. If you're a parent and you've raised little children, <laughs> I remember there's that look they get 
uh, isn't there? We had a leaders meeting at our house the other day, and one of the little kids was going towards the pool, and Dad kept making, uh, you know, that look and that low tone calling the child away from the pool, and the little one would look at the dad and go closer, and look at the dad and cl go closer. Kids know how to test their limits from early on, don't they? But it's amazing when they've been so naughty, and then you, you, you pick up the child and you give them a, a, a firm smack on the bottom of their nappy, all of a sudden, it's all noise, it's not even pain, it's just boom, and the child can hardly believe that their loving parent, the one that feeds them and sustains them, would ever do such a nasty thing to them, and the tears flow, right? <laughs> well, persecution should not come as a surprise to Jesus' followers. Remember, the context of the Beatitudes is that Jesus is introducing his hearers to the life of what following him looks like. And often your and my biggest challenge is that we don't expect persecution. We say, Jesus, I'll follow you. I'll turn my back on my sins. I'll read my Bible. I'll pray. I'll live a life that pleases you. And when things don't go 100% uh, moonshine and roses, we almost turn around and think, oh God, do you even exist? Have you left me alone? Because we, we're surprised by persecution. We shouldn't be. Jesus says it will come and we will be blessed if we walk through it well. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Paul writes to Timothy. Now remember, Timothy was one of his protégés, this young guy who he was training and mentoring, his, his um, friend and disciple who he taught and then released to go and lead churches and minister and travel on his behalf. But Timothy also needed some, some gumption from time to time. Paul just needed to give him a bit of strength of, of character. And Paul writes this, he says, in fact... Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How's that for an encouragement? He says, while well, evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, how could Paul make such a sweeping statement? Imagine sitting with your, with your protege saying, I'm wanting to send you to go and minister in this place or that context. He says, but actually make no mistake, if you want to live a godly life, persecution will find you. I wonder if Timothy didn't start thinking twice, you know. Maybe he should just politely suggest that he'll stay at home, uh, you know, and, and, and just pray from where he's at. Well, John Piper answers this question this way. He says, The conviction is rooted in the nature of fallen man and the nature of a new creation in Christ. Remember, as believers, you're not just a little different to a non-believer, but the one says that the Bible says that the one lives in the kingdom of light and the other lives in the kingdom of darkness. The one is dead in his sins, the other is a new creation, the Bible tells us. And this conviction is that sooner or later a deeply God-centered Christian will be mistreated for the things that he believes or the life that he lives. You know, to one degree or another, all of you who are dead earnest about putting God first in your work and home and school and leisure will bump into some kind of opposition sooner or later. It's guaranteed to come. The Bible warns us. And you might say, but why on earth would we be, would be being poor in spirit or humble or meek or merciful or a peacemaker attract persecution? You, you might think, man, I'm trying to be such a nice guy. Why does it go wrong? Well, there's two reasons primarily. The two reasons we face opposition are based on love and justification, just justifying our actions. Let me explain. We'll use an example from Luke chapter 13, uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 13. Jesus said to the Pharisees, not to any crowd, to the Pharisees, he said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Verse 14 says, the Pharisees, and here's the trick, number one, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, you are the ones who justify, second point, justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. Two reasons why we are persecuted. The example in this passage is the love of something and the attempt to justify our actions. You see, in other words, Jesus' attitude to money is an attack on their love for money. 
When it comes to the rest of the explanation, why they were mocking Jesus, verse 15 says, you are those who justify yourself before men. So there are two reasons why we should expect to face persecution. The first is the love of something evil or untrue. There's something that's got into their heart that is not Jesus Christ. And God says, you can't have two masters. In your heart, you will love one master and you'll de despise the other. In this case, around money, it's either money or God. I think there's many idols that can go in our hearts. The love of something other than God is an idol and we are idolaters. Then the second reason we are persecuted is because there is a need inside of us to justify that love. Have you ever made a, uh, uh, done something that you thought was a good idea and it turned out to be so bad in the end? Man, afterwards you're saying, well, it was because of this or the economy turned on me or the client never phoned me back or we struggle just to own our stuff, don't we? <laughs> you look at kids in the house, it's always brother's fault or sister made me do that. Yeah? or the devil, or someone else, we struggle to take personal responsibility. It's not enough for us to d agree to disagree. Wouldn't be that, that would be fine. If you're not a believer in Jesus, how can I expect you to be uh, exemplifying a follower of Jesus? Doesn't make sense. So let's agree to disagree. But that's not enough for the world. The world wants Christians to embrace their actions as acceptable. And the root is that deep down their consciences are actually being pricked and they are aware they're running far from God. You see, this is the root cause of persecution. We said two reasons, the love of evil or untruth and then the justifying of that. You see, if you cherish chastity, then your life will be, it will show others up who love free sex. If you embrace temperance, then your life will be a statement against those who love alcohol. If you pursue self-control, then you will indict those who love to excess eat. If you live simply and happily, you will show the folly of luxury. If you walk humbly with your God, you will expose the evil of pride. If you are spiritually minded, you will expose the worldly mindedness of those around you. You see, the fact that we shine brightly for Jesus, exposes the darkness in other people. And instead of just agreeing to kind of make space for each other because their consciences are pricked, they know they're guilty whether they're admitted or not, then the world wants to come against us and cause us to become like them. That's called the root of persecution. The third thing I want to say is that heaven is our secret weapon. I so love that Jesus hasn't left us, the Bible says, as orphans. He's given us a father and he's promised us a home in eternity. There was a man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you may know him. He was a Christian who worked against the Nazis in the Second World War. And he was captured, imprisoned and sentenced to death right at the end of the Second World War, 1945. He was sentenced to hang because he worked against the Nazis. Ten years later, the camp doctor wrote this. He said, in almost... 50 years that I worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so in such an entirely submissive way to the will of God. This was just the camp doctor, and he saw this man go to his death because he served God. It was persecution, and he did it submitted to the will of God. You see, Jesus wants his disciples to desire the reward of heaven more than we desire the reward of this world. I would say to you this morning, our greater th greatest threat to embracing persecution for Jesus' sake is our love of this life too much. Revelation tells us those who overcame the world, they did it by the blood of the Lamb, their word of their testimony, and they're loving not their lives unto death. Now I know we have family and we have loved ones and there's many reasons to stay here in this world. But friends, when we love eternity more than we love this life, then serving Jesus in any way he calls us to serve him becomes a joy and heaven is our secret weapon. Matthew chapter 19 says, don't lay up for you yourselves treasures on earth where, the, where people can steal it, where it can rust and so on, but rather lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. The last thing I want to say this morning is that persecution leads to the great commission. So yes, we can expect persecution, there is a reason for persecution because the world, our light shines up there dark. 
The third thing is that heaven is our secret weapon. We know this is a temporary life and we're building treasures in heaven, rewards that will come. The fourth thing is that persecution aids the Great Commission. You see, there's another side to the blessedness of persecution beyond ourselves and our own trials. It's the ability to have a testimony which we can display to others and point others to Jesus. Romans chapter 10 verse 14, it says, How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? There are people that need to see how you bear up for Jesus, even when they persecute you, because it will turn them to salvation and Jesus Christ. Remember, we spoke about Open Doors, the, the ministry, and their, uh, their website states that we stake our lives in Jesus' great commission. We take his command so seriously that we will take risks to this day to get copies of the gospel into hostile areas. We do this because we love God and we are inspired by the life and the teachings of Jesus who often went out of his way to spend time being present with the vulnerable people on the margins of society. You see, Jesus promised, blessed are the persecuted for my sake because great is your reward in heaven. But in addition to that, he offers the opportunity to point others to him. I have rewards, but I also have the privilege of even in my struggles and my suffering from allowing others to meet Jesus and become born again and have a wonderful welcome into heaven one day. It gives meaning to our trials and significance to our sacrifice. So the question then, as we've asked right through counterculture series, is how then should we live? In the light of blessed are the persecuted, how should we live? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is seen, and not what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Friends, as you and I want to represent Jesus when persecution comes, first of all, we should delight that we get to represent Jesus. Secondly, if we live with eternity in mind, it gives meaning to our struggles in this life. And thirdly, that I willingly offer my entire life to Jesus to point others towards him. Lord, if you want my job, if you want my family, if you want my country, if you want my address, if you want my riches, my health, my happiness, whether I'm where I want to be or you ask me to go somewhere tough or do something that's uncomfortable, I want to do it to point people to Jesus. We delight that we can represent Jesus. We live with eternity in mind and we let our lives point others to Jesus. Friends, Do you want to live a life that's pleasing to Jesus? A life that works to change our nation for good? Then the challenge is simple. Will you and I live counter-cultural lives? Or will we just give in and go with the flow and follow the difficulties in our society? Or will you and I stand up and say, no, I represent Jesus. My home is not this one. It's eternal. (laughs) Live a counter-cultural life and display Jesus' love to those around you. God bless you. Thank you for the great word, Craig. I'm trusting that we have all enjoyed the service. See you again next week. May the blood of Jesus protect you throughout the week. Bye. Cheers. Take care.